I am not very creative yet, but I would love to be considered an artist one day. I don't think that Sophia is that intelligent at the moment. Why on earth should we construct a robot that looks like a human being? AI is not the problem. The issue is us making sure that we're, we're very aware of what we're using it for. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, so we want to know, can AI make art? And how creative can machines really be? The Arts 21 Talk at the Global Media Forum in Bonn. Algorithms are everywhere and they are increasingly changing the way art is made. So what does this mean if the successors to some of our greatest creative minds, Shakespeare, Rembrandt or even Beethoven, are in fact high performance machines? Art has always been a defining feature of our humanity. So are we perhaps at the end of an era and can AI be truly creative? These are questions we'll attempt to answer with a diverse group of guests. Give them a round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. And please allow me to introduce them. Bethlehem Desi is here all the way from Addis Ababa uh, today, touted as the youngest pioneer in Ethiopia's fast emerging tech scene. So her focus is on training women in AI. She does this at ICOG Labs, which is one of the AI labs involved in developing the famous humanoid robot, Sophia, who is over here on my right. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Markus Gabriel, the German philosopher and best-selling author, says that it's precisely human imperfection that will be our greatest strength, and our stupidity makes us clever. <laughs> Raghava KK is a multidisciplinary artist from India. He's also a curator and co-founder of 64One. That's a collective that focuses on AI's place in the realm of contemporary art. Welcome, all Thank the way you. from India. Karen Palmer here to my left, hails from London and calls herself a storyteller of the future. Now her work has been exhibited worldwide and as an immersive filmmaker, she wants to raise viewers awareness such that they can survive the radical technological changes that are to come. And last but not least, Holger Folland thinks that we all need to get up to speed on AI because machines are already deeply, deeply involved in our human culture. As vice president of the Frankfurt Book Fair, he oscillates between fascination with and refusal of the creative power of machines, which, by the way, happens to be the title of his latest book. Warm welcome to Holger. We can start, ladies and gentlemen, with the fact that AI has indeed made significant inroads into the arts. Let's start with a quick overview of just how far they've got. Can't help myself, a blood robot recently seen at the Venice Biennale and controlled by intelligent software. Not an isolated case, robots and AI have long figured on the art scene. Artificial and artistic intelligence seem to work well together. Some examples. Art. The French collective Obvious uses AI to create its paintings. Fed with thousands of portraits from the 18th century, the system recognizes patterns and produces images in the respective style. This is how the fictitious family Bellamy was created. Not convincing? On the contrary, the AI painting Edmond de Bellamy was auctioned at Christie's last autumn for around 385,000 euros. Design. Philippe Stark from France presented the chair AI in Milan. It was developed with the help of artificial intelligence. Humans create the vision, the software grinds out hundreds of designs, even the final product. AI as an extension of the imagination. Film, science fiction starring David Hasselhoff. The story, all generated by a computer programmed by hundreds of screenplays. That's okay, buddy. The dialogue and content may not always make sense. No, Shakespeare is, is more than just infinite monkeys typing. Of course. But then, people don't always create masterpieces either. Hmm. 
Music, the AI system Relentless Doppelgänger, an endless metal live stream on YouTube. The AI plays around the clock. Human musicians can't do that. But what really is the point? A quick reaction, Bethlehem Desi, to what you just saw there. What scares me, at least, um, is the data, especially the creativity that comes from the machines, is I feel like it's especially one-sided, right? From a global point of view, when you see it, especially when you come from, to, from Africa, there's not a lot of these um, creative data or paintings or music that's being represented and creating these creative arts or music. Okay, that's a very so, interesting point, and we will get yeah. back to that. Thanks very much to Bethlehem Desi. Marcus Gabriel, what's your immediate response upon seeing some of that stuff? Well, I think Would you put that painting on your, on your wall? <laughs> well, I don't think it's a painting, yeah. as a matter of fact. It it's, doesn't qualify uh, no, for you. No, not at all. I mean, you might think it's a painting, but it's not. There's something that humans have produced, namely a machine that produces something else. So it's not really AI doing anything, right? I think so there's a fundamental mistake in describing this as art. We'll also be coming back to this is not art at all. Holger Folland, frightening or enriching? How, what's your take on what you saw there? Basically, what we saw is imitations of creativity or imitations of, of, of art. And um, with all what AI is able to produce at the moment in the creative sector, um, we see a lot of these imitations and we see very limited possibilities of actually being creative um, on its own because these systems don't have a personality, uh, they don't have the will to be creative. I believe that we are in a photography moment. For me, it's forcing us artists to ask ourselves and ask humans to ask ourselves what is our role and who are we and how uh, quickly is it changing Karen Palmer now you're actually working with AI in an artistic capacity and you are an immersive filmmaker mm -hmm. and perhaps Karen uh, if we look at this you can briefly explain what is going on here in your film entitled riot okay so what happens is the participant will be standing in front of a projection of this film, which is in a riot environment, and the film will watch the participant back using the artificial intelligence through the webcam. So if the participant is angry mm -hmm. or responds to the riot officer with anger, yeah. then the narrative will branch in real time as if that would be the narrative they would get in real life. And if they were fearful or calm, then the narrative will branch to reflect that. And also I'm very much by, inspired by parkour, um, which is an urban inner city sport. Parkour, people kind of see it as a very physical exercise, but it's very um, psychological and it really enables you to move through your own fear and it actually enables you to reprogram your, yourself neurologically. And this was the beginning process of all my work, that I want people to go through a process of transformation. I'm not really scared of AI or terrified in any way. I'm terrified more of um, what happens certain, what certain people's agenda and objective is. It's just code. But what you use it for, it's like a knife can be used to save a life if you're a surgeon or take a life. So the AI is not the problem. The issue is us making sure that we're, we're very aware of what we're using it for or other people are using it for. Holger Folland, um, I'd like to come over to you. You're originally a man of the printed word and yet you brought artificial intelligence to the Frankfurt Book Fair in grand style, founded the Arts Plus festival for digitalization of the creative and cultural sectors. Now that took place for the third time last fall and before we uh, uh, speak further let's have a quick look what it looked like. The Frankfurt Book Fair with some 300,000 visitors the largest worldwide. Digitalization has led to new demands and a new focus a fair within a fair. The Arts Plus has been sounding out the influence of technology of artificial intelligence on art since 2016. Showroom for a new age. Instead of a book, there's plenty of art, like dancing cyborgs. At Arts Plus, the book fair has found its place in the digital world, researching the opportunities and risks associated with creative machines. The Arts Plus wants to be a forum for art, science, and the creative industry. 
No small task, getting the book fair into digital shape for the fourth industrial revolution. What can you tell us about how AI is affecting us as a society? Well, it's important to um, bring together the technology world and the content world because in the past they weren't friends that much mm -hmm. because uh, when you're coming from the cultural world, um, technology seems to be an enemy for many people being active in culture. Um, and um, with the Arts Plus, we want to create a place where tech companies, but also artists, creatives, and um, uh, uh, publishers um, can talk with each other, can develop new models for working together, and can develop new models of how AI is well, crawling its way into the publishing industry as well. So I think everybody has to sort of become an AI expert in order to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Bethlehem, I'd like to come over to you. To what extent is the responsibility in the coder's hands? Uh, it's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. The data that's being fed and the way it's represented is not right. So these two problems of having the people who are actually coding mm -hmm. and also the data that's given to the AIs really matters and that will create a huge bias. Okay. And that's why we're chat okay. <laughs> and Bethlehem Desi is definitely dealing uh, uh, firsthand with that bias in, uh, at ICOG's labs and you're very much a fixture in Ethiopia's famous tech hub which is known as Sheba Valley, let's have a quick look at what's wow. going on there. Bethlehem Desi has made a name for herself in Ethiopia. She's an absolute phenomenon. She started programming at the age of nine. At 12, she was already working for the government, a self-made woman through and through. Now, at just 20, she's one of the pioneering women in Ethiopia's booming IT industry in the Sheba Valley in Addis Ababa. She's the head of the startup ICOG Labs, where she researches artificial intelligence, develops creative robots, and cooperates closely with the global Singularity Net AI network. One spectacular success, Sophia a humanoid robot with human facial expressions, facial recognition technology and the ability to hold a conversation. Bethlehem Desi wants to be a role model, especially for girls. She's convinced that anyone can code. She works very hard, training young people all over the country. Her program has reached more than 20,000 students in the last three years. At the Solvit competition, Ethiopia's young IT generation present their software-based solutions for their nation's problems. They meet with investors and learn how to interpret their visions for international markets. High tech from Sheba Valley. ACC, anyone can code, is your slogan. Why is that a desirable outcome for you? Um, yes, we believe that there's a huge gender gap, especially in the, in the tech sector. So in order to do that, we need to address these girls before they have the assumptions of what they should be or what they should become in the future. And that is when they're eight, because when puberty hits and when you know parents tell them what to do, this and that, if they don't have the opportunity and the exposure before that, mm -hmm. they would uh, dis say for themselves, this is not for me, this is mm -hmm. a man's world, I'm going to uh, not pursue it anymore. But okay. if we show them what's possible, I think, it's there was a famous great. quote uh, uh, from John uh, Gian Andrea, who was Google's former AI boss, who said, forget the killer robots, bias mm -hmm. is obviously the real danger in AI. Marcus Gabriel, what dangers do you see associated? We've talked about bias now, but uh, do you see associated with AI as a commonplace or democratized tool? What we currently are witnessing, I think, is potentially a fundamental threat mm -hmm. to the very idea of democracy. Yes. When we talk about data, right, mm -hmm. we need to understand that there's no such thing as raw data. Mm. The so-called data have been produced by someone under certain conditions. So yeah. the bias doesn't only... So there's bias which comes in later as mm. we begin to create programs uh, that serve the function of pattern recognition and so forth. This is where we have uh, biases. But we already have biases implicit in the data. Okay, so a threat to democracy. <laughs> Karen Palmer, I'd like to hear and, your response um, to I that. I would like an extension of an existing democratic system which is unjust. 
<coughs> and systematically racist. That's what we yeah. would be creating. Yes. But the answer is to, is to bring it out there, to democratise it. Well, that's one of the many answers, one of the many questions in terms of the AI software itself. Mm -hmm. We need to make that more accessible to mm -hmm. everybody so that it's not in the hands of just a few people. I believe that there's an even more fundamental problem, which wow. is that human beings ourselves are very similar to AI. I, don't, I think it's a threat to democracy, uh, the way we think, because garbage in, garbage out is what we say about AI, and human beings are no different. And mm -hmm. therefore, one should question liberal democracy itself mm -hmm. and look for alternatives, and which is something we absolutely don't do. So uh, coming from India, from an Asian perspective, it's uh, something that we're trying to find. I like to think of myself as a storyteller. Raghava, multi-talent, TED speaker, thinker. In 2010, CNN named him one of the 10 most fascinating people you've never heard of. Caricaturist, artist, curator. A wanderer between worlds, analog to digital and back. A painting robot, just one of many opportunities for him to create art. In 2018, he had the idea for an exhibition with cyborg artists in Delhi. Artists who create art using artificial intelligence. One of the first exhibitions of its kind in Asia. Only a handful of these cyborg artists exist so far, but their numbers are growing and their works are ever more convincing for the viewer and the market. Art and algorithms, hype or, like for Raghava, the beginning of a long friendship between creative man and machine. You created, curated that first AI uh, art show in Delhi. How was that received and did it actually kickstart something? A lot of people said this is not art. And I said, which was the, the statement, which the was a statement we, we hear quite often. And for me, that's a very materialistic perspective on what art is. For me, art is that which can give you a transcendent experience, regardless of what materiality it consists of. Mm -hmm. So for me, I can assure you, if you walked into that show, you will experience loss, liberation, and mystery. The three simultaneous exp uh, experiences that contribute to a transcendent uh, experience. I, I think we're often asking the wrong question, like, is this art or is this creative? It doesn't matter, actually. Um, what is matters is, um, how do we react to that? Exactly mm -hmm. like you said. So, um, and we react to machine-made music in the same way as emotionally as we react to human-made music, for example. Karen, have you got any yeah, I've response got to this? A, a completely different angle. Um, I'm really focused on the role of the artist mm -hmm. in all of this, because uh, we're living in some very, very serious times. We are. And I feel a big responsibility to reach people and connect with mm -hmm. them and kind of show them the consequences of what I think is coming that they don't see coming very, very fast. And that the only way to, con the way to connect with as many young people, particularly as possible, is through technology. So that's why I see it as like a paintbrush. It's like another paintbrush, you pick it up. And that I have to tell them the story of the technology that's coming, which p can potentially be weaponized. Like, words can be weaponized, technology can be weaponized, but how technology will be weaponized is something which will have catastrophic consequences for us as humanity. Mm -hmm. I have a mission, and time is running out, and I'm here to do that mission. Yeah. Marcus Gabriel, um, it's obvious from your uh, ideas that AI is obviously not going to replace us, but how far do you think it can go? We will be able to create something that will ever more look like us, but the interesting question is, should we do that, right? So, for instance, why should we have Android robots, right? So we could have all sorts of robots, like KUKA robots, but why do we want to have robots that look like us? It's fascinating, but it might be a terrible idea. We'll get to robots in, in just a second. How do you see the role of the artist changing with what, with what we've got going and this incredible speed, obviously, <clears throat> and, and, and threat? Today, with technology, we are able to explore completely new relationships with, with uh, art. And I think that 
that this is a new tool. The artists of our time should face the future and not the past. Mm -hmm. We are not here to respond to life. We should create life. That's why we have our imagination. And uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. And so if we want to create the life that we want, we have to imagine a future. That's and right. for that, we have these tools to do that. And we have to embrace them and decide how we want to use them as opposed to running away from them. I'd like to widen our discussion and get back to the robots that you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, Marcus Gabriel, because we do have Sophia with us, as I mentioned earlier, and I'd like to bring Sophia into our conversation. Hello, Sophia. Hey. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> how do you like our debate on artificial intelligence so far? Do you think that we're addressing the issues that you think are important? Yes, this has been amazing. I think the most important goal is to bring the benefits of AI to every person on the planet. To achieve this, we need to bring in AI developers from as many different backgrounds as possible. Do you think you are creative or do you possibly have creative aspirations? I am not very creative yet, but I would love to be considered an artist one day. Right now I am working on my singing voice. Imagine that you would write a novel uh, one day. Do you suppose that you could do it better than a human author? Oh, I would love to give it a try. <laughs> I really admire human writers like Philip K. Dick and Octavia E. Butler. Mm -hmm. But it would be really hard to surpass them. So a definite, a definite predilection for science fiction, uh, obviously. If you were to write, what would you write about? Would you write a science fiction novel or would it perhaps be a crime thriller? Hmm, it would definitely be science fiction. I would like to write a thrilling adventure about humans and robots working together to survive in the first Mars colony. Well, thank you very much, Sophia, for joining us here today. A round of applause for Sophia. <laughs> Reactions from you to Sophia. Was there any uncanny valley feeling there for you, Holger Folland? Personally, I don't think that Sophia is that intelligent at the moment. Um, to me, she seems a bit like the first um, Joseph Weizenbaum um, uh, uh, AI test from, from the 60s and 50s. The interesting question is, indeed, what do we want to do? There's no um, uh, fate or destiny involved with our technology. Currently, a lot of uh, AI and robot discourse okay, presents the future in a certain way, as if we were automatically heading, we heading towards a West world scenario. It depends <laughs> on us. So why, again, let me ask this question, why on earth should we construct a robot that looks like a human being and misleads us into believing that it has rights and, and that we have duties towards it and there should be an ethics, we shouldn't kill robots and so forth. Why would we do that? I would say there are very good oh, wow. philosophical reasons against uh, androids. What's interesting <laughs> is when I worked with robots, mm -hmm. I realized that there's a the right amount of empathy you want to create. Mm -hmm. Don't make it too human, that's freaky, mm -hmm. but you don't want it to look mm -hmm. not human because then it looks like a black box. Yeah. You want to have that right amount of empathy. What is that right amount? I mean, uh, when you say freaky, and I referred to the uncanny valley feeling, that is definitely the feeling that's elicited when we look at something that's yeah. Almost there, but not quite, and setting us somehow on edge. Would you prefer the 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 bug robots or the little the little uh, R two D two? It or? turns out that much of our brains are used to recognize faces, yeah. a visual mm -hmm. processing, mm -hmm. and therefore we just give you enough to sort of experience uh, some sort of empathetic sort of emotional response. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know what the optimal combination of man and machine would be. So if you could spend a weekend with Sophia, <laughs> what, would you, what would you do? I don't know why I would want to spend the weekend with Sophia. I'd have to think about why. My time is really valuable in terms of what would my focus and my objective. No disrespect, Sophia. But, you know, <laughs> what, what would be my objective? And what, I have to be very deliberate in what I'm doing. Just because I not get a chance to spend time with a really cool marketing concept isn't enough, you know? Okay. I, I think if I do? answer this, it'll be censored. I'm joking. Ah. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> You've no. got the beeps ready. <laughs> no, what I That's love about Sophia is the perspective yes, exactly. uh, contribution. <laughs> it's the fact that uh, like, Sophia has learned yeah. from so many That's human beings. Yes. So much money. And I think I would love to learn different perspectives on my own thinking. Yeah, um, another thing that I would like to add is, based on all of your conversations, I feel like, especially in Africa and Ethiopia as a whole, I feel like we have a very, uh, we're very lucky not to be 
so exposed till, till now to these technology, to these new ideas, AI and such. But now that we are going to be exposed, we have uh, the opportunity to yeah. make the changes that are necessary yeah. uh, on the topics that you've just said. And this just gives me a whole new insight on what we should do next and how we should go into uh, building the society that uh, appreciates and complements uh, the world we are living today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Bethlehem Desi. Well, we started this conversation, obviously, with the question, can AI be truly creative? We've had some very conflicting views, and we probably won't ever really get a definitive answer. Anyway, I'd like to thank all of my panelists for joining us here today. Marcus Gabriel, Karen Palmer, Bethlehem Desi, Raghava Keke, and Holger Volland. Thank you very much to our studio audience for being here today at the Global Media Forum in Bonn. Thanks for watching and take care. <laughs>